Okay, so today I want to give um, a talk to you guys about directed homotopy type theory. Um, before I start, I first want to say um, that I've put these notes in the GitHub repository in the day five um, synthetic homotopy type theory folder if you want to um, follow along or annotate the notes yourself or something. Um, right, so you've seen a lot of lectures, you've seen a lot of homotopy uh, type theory and similar things in the past week. And this is the last talk. So um, thanks a lot for coming to this one after seeing so many good ones. I hope you have um, some space in your brain for a little bit more information. Um, but this talk will be mainly about kind of um, different directions um, and different interesting things that you might want to do with um, homotopy type theory or the ideas um, that we've learned from homotopy type theory. Okay, so let's just um, start with some motivation just to orient ourselves. Um, maybe I won't look very often um, at the chat. So if someone wants to read me the questions, sure. um, that would be great. I think there's a lot of discussion that's tangential happening there. Okay, anyway, but back to the motivation. Um, so we've learned a lot about HOT um, from maybe a mathematical or um, homotopical perspective. We would say that HOT is great because um, it provides the theory for spaces for homotopy types. Um, and in particular, the particular benefits we get from using HOT are that um, it's kind of all encompassing um, in, a, in logical terms. We might say that it's one theory um, that applies to many models, maybe even all models in some sense of, of homotopy theory. Um, so when we prove a theorem in homotopy type theory, then we get a lot out. We, we see that's true in, in many, many different situations in um, say classical mathematics or something like that. Um, of course, it's also machine checkable. So when we write a proof, we can check it. That's really great. Um, and then also, I mean, it just provides a different perspective. Some proofs are much easier or some um, new theories are much, much more uh, easy to develop in homotopy type theory than in the more um, concrete models of, of classical homotopy theory. Okay, so now I wanna um, talk a little bit about what I mean by directed homotopy theory. So let's just leave out the word type for a second. Um, so when we think about spaces, there are different representations, um, at least in my mind for spaces, I mean, equipments are all really the same. So we have, um, for instance, actual topological spaces, like here I've tried to draw a torus. Um, so this is in the, the category of topological spaces. Um, then often we consider instead of those, and often when we are doing like models of homotopy type theory, um, we're considering instead of um, the usual like old fashioned topological spaces, we're thinking about um, combinatorial models like simplicial sets or cubical sets. And then of course, um, we have an alternate representation which I didn't know how to draw, so I just wrote a T for just uh, a type in homotopy type theory. Okay. And in all of these three things, I mean, they're all representations of the same thing. Um, we have, of course, a notion of path, um, and which is the identity type and homotopy type theory, of course. And here the paths um, have many different properties that you might be interested in, but in particular, they're um, reflexive. So we always have um, a path from one point or one term to itself. They're reversible. So if we have a path um, or an identification from A to B, then there's also one from B to A and they're composable. So if we have one from A to B and one from B to A, then there's also one from A to B. Okay, so there are, I just wanna make the point that there are many interesting structures that are very similar to this, but where the paths um, that we want to consider are just reflexive and composable, but not necessarily reversible. And this is where um, directed homotopy theory arises. Okay, so here are some examples of those kinds of things. So um, first of all, we have category theory and higher category theory. Um, hopefully everyone I think uh, is familiar with category theory since the, the other lecturers have been using it quite a bit. So in a category, of course, we have a collection of objects and a collection of morphisms between them. Um, those morphisms are reflexive in the sense that there's always an identity morphism for any object. And they're composable, of course. Um, uh, but they're not necessarily reversible unless we're interested in group voice. And similarly for higher categories, I don't think um, higher categories have come up too much explicitly in this week, but there's something similar. So we not only have objects 
at which we start to call zero cells in the general case. But we also have uh, one cells between every two pair of zero cells, which is normally what's called amorphism or an arrow in the one categorical case. And then between every two um, pair of every pair of two cells, F and G that are themselves between the same two um, zero cells, we can consider um, the set of two cells between those two guys. And then similarly, we can consider three cells between pairs of two cells and four cells between pairs of three cells and on and on. And then we get um, a theory of higher categories. Okay, so that's one notion of directedness. We have all of these cells, which are all um, kinds of paths and higher paths. They're all reflexive and composable, but certainly not reversible unless we're doing um, groupoid theory. Now we also might consider um, something that seems very similar, but um, actually quite different, which is the theory of directed spaces. So this is um, certainly much less well known than higher categories, but in my mind, also very important. It has a lot of interesting applications. So a directed space, um, there are many different definitions, many kinds of definitions of directed spaces and many um, people have shown that um, much of those are equivalent to each other. But here are just um, some examples of definitions. Um, so for example, we could take a directed space to be a topological space, but an ambient topological space together with um, a chosen subset of its paths that we call then directed paths. And these are closed under, we say that these are closed under reflexivity um, so that they, they contain all the reflexivity paths, all the constant identity paths and also concatenation composition. Um, and I also just want to remark that there are other um, in particular uh, combinatorial definitions. So uh, this one that I'm mentioning is based on bicubical sets. Um, it's a, quite complicated actually to give the definition. It would maybe take the whole hour, so I won't do that. But I just want to remark that just like, uh, just like with um, normal topology, we have kind of the old fashioned representation and then the more modern combinatorial rep representation. Here we have um, similar kind of alternate representations. Okay, maybe I can pause and ask if anybody has any questions so far. I guess it's just motivation, but. Okay, so um, what are some examples of directed spaces? Why are they even interesting? I mean, I guess I'm just kind of taking for granted the fact that higher categories are interesting, they're very well studied, but directed spaces are a little bit more niche. Um, so we have many examples coming from um, applied mathematics. So first of all, we might consider um, dynamical systems where you have some manifold equipped with some um, gradient flow and this um, gives a bit more information than you need for a directed space, but in particular, you obtain, um, as I said, some kind of flow on the space, and this um, can give you the, the subset of directed paths. So like, for example, maybe to make this um, notion of directed space very concrete. So if we're here in a boring manifold, at least in this um, little patch of the manifold that I've drawn, uh, looks like R2, we you know, have a path like this, this green one here, right here, and we also have a path that goes backwards, um, just uh, along the same, the same uh, trail, I guess, as they, but going backwards. But um, once we start thinking about directed topological spaces, then we're prescribing um, with this subset of directed paths, a particular flow. So here I've written in green, maybe some of the directed paths and we're explicitly excluding the ones um, going backwards, say along along these arrows. Okay, so another application comes from um, computer science. So some people have compared um, uh, semantics for concurrent processes to uh, directed topological spaces, and they've done this by th thinking of a concurrent process in the following way. So a concurrent process is just um, two processes running in parallel. And the thing to be worried about when you um, think about these kinds of things is what happens when they try to access the same resource. Right? So if you have two guys in parallel trying to access the same resource, since you're not um, prescribing how they, like the order in which they access the resource because it's not sequential, um, it might happen that the first guy accesses it first, 
does something weird and the second guy then access the second does something weird or the other way around and the order in which they, they get to the, the resource might completely alter the result of the computation. Um, so we want to understand this kind of thing. So for example, just um, as an illustrating example, we can consider uh, two processes A and B. And let's say that they are accessing um, resources N and M. Uh, the processes can, like there are um, things in our language that allow the processes to um, lock each resource and then unlock each resource. And probably between locking and unlocking, they're maybe going to um, change some memory or something, but we're not um, thinking about that explicitly, just the, the locking and the unlocking. And so if we look at this um, representation of A and B running in parallel, we can uh, think about B first doing uh, LN, so it's first locking resource N, then locking resource M, then unlocking M, then unlocking N. And A is doing almost the same thing, except that the order of M and N is switched. So say it wants to first lock M and then lock N and then unlock N and then unlock M. Well, the order in which um, A and B might get to N and M uh, changes some things. So uh, first of all, we can see that um, I've drawn these, these black rectangles because suppose that we're here. Well, let, let me um, say some, a few words so that we understand what's going on. So the idea is that we, we think about um, the concurrent process of A and B running in parallel as a kind of um, interleaving of A and B. So we could first have a, a B, sorry, do this step, and then maybe A do this step, and then B do this step, and then A do this step. So we're thinking about there being these kinds of stepwise um, executions through this space. And um, so, if we're thinking uh, just about A for a second, there's this time when uh, N is completely locked by A between these two guys. So if we maybe just first, uh, if A just first grabs hold of the whole thing and we get to this step here um, before B does anything, well then maybe B can lock N, or sorry, B cannot lock N, what am I saying? B cannot lock N and it can't then even proceed to do any of these things. So this whole region of the state space is not possible. And similarly, between um, the times, or like, let's say during the times when B has M locked up, A cannot access M at all. So all of these states are not possible. And so we have this space left, some um, subspace of R2 um, with a kind of um, induced flow on it remembering that the um, uh, traces of execution can only happen by like doing something like this and then something like this and something like this and then something like this and something like this. We certainly can't start here and then just go backwards like this or something. So we can only go to the right and up. So that gives us, that gives us space um, a direction. And then we can study this, study these programs with topological methods by saying like here in this space, um, there's some deadlock because if you end up here, um, there's no way to say, get to the, the desired final state. And here the states in this space are um, not reachable at all. There's no way to get say from here, the initial state all the way over to here, you would have to go um, against the flow. And you can also say that um, up to homotopy, up to undirected homotopy in particular, there are just these two um, traces of execution. So we're almost kind of looking at the um, some kind of directed fundamental group of, of the space and saying that it's that is equal to um, two in some way. Okay, so that's um, one another example of um, dynamical or sorry directed spaces. And then also there is some work being done by people who are not exactly using the theory of directed spaces but are using a lot of the tools of um, directed topology and they are studying um, the connectome networks of neurons in actual brains, um, which you can think of as at least a directed graph because the neurons, the, uh, I think these are the dendrites, if I remember correctly, they take in some um, chemicals, propagate some electrical impulse and then release some chemicals and then to the next neuron. So all the little neurons are, are directed, um, they form a directed graph and um, some people have used topological methods to kind of extend that to a, a directed um, 
simplicial or capable complex and, and use uh, topological methods to study the brain. Okay, so that's hopefully, I have a question mark there because I hope that maybe um, more theoretical work can be done to kind of uh, make this, this area of research a bit more robust. Does anybody have any questions about any of these examples? Okay, so these are some um, examples of directed topological spaces, but now let's go back to um, higher categories. And I'm going to give in this lecture um, uh, an introduction to two uh, completely different ideas for what directed um, homotopy type theory could be. Um, so this first one is trying to capture uh, higher categories and the second one is trying to capture directed spaces. Okay, so this first one is, um, you could say a directed type theory for infinity one categories and it's due to Emily Real and Mike Schulman. Um, so I suggest a little bit what a higher category was but in particular, an infinity one category, um, if you haven't heard of this before, it's a higher category. So it has all these zero cells, one cells, two cells, three cells, et cetera. But um, the reason why we have this one here is because we're um, saying that the two cells, three cells, four cells, et cetera, all the things above level one um, are all reversible. So it's all groupoidal um, above levels zero and one. Okay. So um, I just want to kind of uh, draw attention to the relationship between the directed um, uh, structure of this theory and the undirected uh, structure that's happening here. So we, of course, just as in a regular old category, we have isomorphisms. We're very interested in when things are isomorphic. Um, in a higher category, we maybe use the word equivalence more often. That's just the, the analog. Um, and so we certainly have in every infinity one category, every higher category, um, a notion of undirected or reversible paths that are the equivalences. And then we also, um, I'm trying to uh, read the chat if anyone has an interesting question. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, someone's asking if it's a directed graph or directed multigraph for neurons. So they start with a directed graph and then they turn that into a simplicial um, complex. Um, but probably, yeah, you're right. It's probably a multigraph. I guess as a category theorist, I call a multigraph a graph. Okay. Um, all right, so we have this notion of um, equivalences in an infinity one category or a higher category. And we also have a notion, of course, of um, directed or non-reversible paths, which are just the, all the cells. Um, and in this theory, uh, well, in the theory of infinity one categories, these are certainly um, a subset, sub collection of these guys. Um, of course, the equivalences are special um, N cells. And so in this theory um, by Real and Schulman, they use the regular old Martin Love identity type basically to capture these guys. And they use um, something very similar to the interval in cubicle type theory to capture these guys. Okay. So does anybody have any questions about that? I see some um, stuff in the chat. Um, so someone's asking about, still about the neurons. So I'm pretty sure it's just um, they just start with a, a graph. Yeah, it's, it's quite a, um, it's a very, uh, the work is being done with experimentalists. So the mathematical side of things are, is not very um, sophisticated yet, but I think there's certainly a lot of like really exciting, exciting stuff that they're developing um, with these neuroscientists. Okay, so um, for the syntax of this um, infinity one type theory, um, I want to give you an idea of what's actually going on here. Um, so there are three layers to the syntax. There are, first of all, um, cubes. So I see I have a typo here, excuse me. Um, so they have um, one particular cube um, that they call two, which we um, should think of as the interval 
And two has two um, canonical elements, you might say, zero and one. So this looks like the, quite like the interval in people type theory. Um, and then they have a, another layer called the topes. And so the first thing you might say is that given um, two points in one interval, you might um, ask whether X is less than or equal to Y. And they call this, um, maybe in other um, contexts we would call it a proposition, they call this guy a tope. And so similarly, um, we can ask if two guys are equal um, in this very strong way, that's also a tope. And then we have um, something that looks a bit unusual. I think um, this is often used as kind of is often used in the context of cubicle type theory, but I saw that Andrew mostly um, did cubicle type theory in the computer. So uh, I don't think you saw this kind of notation with this, this bar. But what's happening here is that um, we have some bit of this context is to do with cubes. And then there's some bit of this context here is just empty, but it's to do with topes. And then we're saying that in the context that X is an element of this interval, definitely X is less than or equal to X. That's true. And so they also make some other axioms. So here we're saying in the context that X, Y, and Z are um, points in the interval. And with this tope um, assumption that X is less than or equal to Y and Y is less than or equal to Z, then we can um, conclude that X is less than or equal to Z. And we also have this assumption, or sorry, this axiom that if X and Y are both in the interval and we know that they're um, both less than or equal to each other, then we're gonna say that this is, uh, I guess in some sense, post sets and that X is equal to Z. And similarly, we have this um, uh, comparability uh, condition. And also we have that um, any guy X is always between zero and one. And also that, that X, uh, that zero equals one is not true. Um, ah, yes, yes, thank you. Someone's saying that this is a typo here. Thank you. Okay, so these are the first, this is the first two layers. We have cubes and topes. And then um, they put those two things together to start talking about uh, shapes. So if we um, can write a sentence like this, that given T in some, some interval, that uh, phi is a tope, then they talk about um, this whole collection of information, this whole judgment as being a shape. And so this is really nice because um, they can define things that, I mean, are certainly just pieces of syntax, but in our minds, we can interpret as shapes. Um, okay, so here are some examples. Let's look at this one first. This is more illuminating, I think. So if we have, let me um, try to draw some pictures of this. So if we have, um, so we're looking at delta two. So if uh, we have two guys in the interval and we're thinking about the interval as being, well, maybe I shouldn't write arrows there. The interval as being like our normal interval in um, Euclidean space or something then uh, having the two guys in the interval is saying that we're looking in the space of the interval times the interval, the, the uh, filled in square. And if we're looking at um, the set of points here where X is less, or sorry, Y is less than or equal to X, then we're picking out this triangle here. So Delta two is, um, I mean, again, just a piece of syntax but at least in our minds, we can certainly uh, interpret it as a triangle like this. And then similarly, uh, it might make a bit more sense to think about now what delta one is. It's just all the guys, or at least like our kind of intuition is telling us that it's representing all the guys in the interval because we have all X and two, so that's that true. And uh, delta zero, I don't think I've written this guy here, but this is kind of the trivial cube, so we should just think about it as, as the point. So delta zero is really just um, intuitively a point. And going up a dimension now, delta three, you can think of in um, three space, it's uh, like this triangle at a dimension and then kind of sliced down. So you get um, a pyramid in three space. 
And we can also uh, define the uh, boundaries of these shapes. Um, move it up here. So for example, um, delta uh, or little delta or partial delta one, I guess I should say, um, should just be the endpoints here of the interval. So it makes sense that we're just saying it's either zero or one. We're looking at either this guy zero or this guy one. And for delta two, we want to pick out this boundary of the triangle. And indeed we do that with uh, y equals zero, that's this guy, x equals one, that's this guy, or x equals y, that's this guy. Okay, does anybody have any questions about that so far? Okay, so we have these two layers, the cubes and the topes. And then um, they put on top of that a third layer, which is just regular old Martin Luff type theory. So, which hopefully we are very familiar with now. So here's an example. Let me switch to my pointer. So here's an example um, of something that you're hopefully very used to. Um, we have here just some arbitrary context in the, the cube part. Uh, here's some arbitrary tope context. Here's some arbitrary type context. And then we're saying if on all this we have two points of A, then we certainly have the identity type between them. We have all the all the normal rules and stuff from Martin Luff type theory. Um, then they also have um, some custom made rules for their type theory. So this uh, looks very complicated, but um, if we just go through it, it's not at all. So uh, if we have for the for this first rule, we um, want to First, suppose that we have um, something like this. So in this um, context that we have some cube, some tope, uh, we get some other tope. And if we know that in this um, context where we have some arbitrary guy here, some arbitrary guy here, our guy psi here, some arbitrary context here, and uh, A depending on all of that, where, phi, uh, sorry, where gamma um, only depends on this, um, so I'm writing here, that gamma only depends on this guy and this guy. And then um, if we, when we restrict um, from psi down to phi, we have an inhabitant of A, then we can construct this thing that I um, want to say we should think of as a kind of analog or certainly some kind of dependent function from um, this shape to A. So that's why I'm writing it like pi of this shape to A. And this information um, we should think of uh, at least categorically as saying that um, this type consists of these um, dependent functions such that if we pre-compose with this um, morphism that's um, not explicitly in the syntax, but um, is one interpretation of what this means. If we precompose this function with this morphism, then we get our original morphism A. So we're just thinking of these as some kind of dependent function from the shape into A that restricts to little a when we are just focus on, on phi. And I also want to point out, because I will use this in a second, that if A um, doesn't depend on this uh, guy here, if it's not a dependent function, but just a regular old function, then we just write it um, as a function like this. Okay, and then similarly, um, if we have these uh, hypotheses plus some extra hypotheses, then we'll be able to get um, rules for inhabitants of these dependent types. Uh, so in particular, um, if we have, uh, in the context psi, which we can think of as kind of the bigger context, if we do have an inhabitant of A that agrees in context phi with our original guy, little a, then we can um, abstract T and find an inhabitant of this kind of dependent function type. Okay, so uh, someone's asking, why do we need X in one? So I is just 
Um, I'm assuming that maybe the person is talking about this. Did I write anything like XM1? I'm not sure, but if the person is talking about something like this, why do we need this? Well, I could be the empty cube, so it could be kind of an, an empty context there. So this is just an arbitrary cube context. Okay, so um, now we can, with all this, uh, with all these ingredients, we can finally define morphisms, which was the whole point to to show how we can um, help some attempts of defining morphisms in type theory. Um, does anybody have any questions before I actually talk about that? Okay, so now um, given all these ingredients, we can define um, morphisms, I mean, not morphisms, not functions between types, but functions morphisms within types, which is the idea of directed um, homotopy type theory. So uh, now what we have is that if we have um, some type A and two points in it, just in some arbitrary context, which unfortunately is very complicated in this, in this theory, then we can easily um, get this judgment where we're saying that, okay, so we have these three guys that are just arbitrary contexts. And now if we're, say we, if we're saying that we have um, an element of the interval, uh, which is either zero or one, then um, we can get an element of A, uh, X, Y. So this is, we can think of this, um, this collection here of, of these two guys as uh, being exactly uh, partial delta one. That's how we defined it. So we can think of this, we think of partial delta one as a two point set and A as a set or a, a space or something. We can think of um, this judgment as being like a morphism from the two element um, set or space into A. So we're just picking out these two, these two uh, terms, four points, X and Y. Okay, so given all of this, we can now define um, morphisms or homomorphisms, I should say, between the points uh, X and Y. So we define them using um, this whole story. We look at functions, I mean, in the sense of this, of course, functions from delta one into A, such that when we restrict to partial delta one, we get these two points, uh, X and Y. So just like um, I told you to think about these dependent functions um, in terms of this diagram, especially if you're categorically minded, it helps you to think about diagrams. Then we should think about these functions or these guys as functions from delta one into A. So remember that delta one is like just a little interval, a little line into A, such that when we restrict to partial delta one, which as I drew a second ago, just two points, um, we just get back X and Y. Okay, so it's just um, all the lines in some sense in A connecting X and Y. And since of course um, this interval didn't have any axioms that made it reversible, these um, paths in A, these homomorphisms are themselves non-reversible. Okay. So now we um, have a definition of morphism or homomorphism within types. Now, of course, we want to define um, how to compose them. And this is an, an also a very nice homotopical way, which will start to look even more um, like the um, homotopical uh, stuff about lifting problems in simplicial sets that uh, Christian talked about a couple of days ago. Okay, so uh, the context here looks a little bit complicated, but let's just read this. So we have some, oops, excuse me, some arbitrary context here. And we're considering, I'm leaving out some details, but um, of course X and Y are elements of some type A in this context. So we're considering some homomorphism F from X to Y, now that we've defined this concept, some homomorphism G from Y to Z in A, and some homomorphism from X to Z um, that we're calling H all in A. And so now given um, this data, we can package, all up, package it all up into um, 
a judgment of this form. So again, this guy, this guy, this guy, are just our arbitrary context from before. Maybe I could have left it out, but I didn't. Um, and then here, this stuff, this uh, uh, cube and this taupe together form the shape delta, um, or sorry, partial delta two, which is just the outline of a triangle. And this produces um, a guy in A, which we can call bracket FGH. And so we should think of it where categorically or topologically minded or something like that as um, a morphism from the outline of this triangle into A that maps um, this edge to F, this edge to G, and this edge to H. Okay, so now using all of this, we can define um, HOM 2A as they call it, this guy, whose argument is all this information, these points X, Y, and Z, these um, morphisms F, G, and H. And the authors do actually start to switch to this um, categorical notation, the diagram picture thing. Um, and so we can define this to be all of the maps from delta two into A. So now delta two is the filled in triangle. So we're looking at all the maps from delta two into A that when we think about just the, um, the boundary partial delta two, we end up with uh, F, G, and H. So with all the possible um, fillings of this, this triangle in A. Um, okay, and we uh, can say that, or the authors say that a type is Siegel if for um, any, to a pair of composable maps, F and G in some, um, or I should say maybe homomorphism to be a bit more consistent, two homomorphisms F and G in some type A. If we take this big sigma type, so we're looking at all of the H's um, and the, this HOM2 thing of F and G together with H, um, we call the type Siegel if this um, big sigma type is contractible. So you can, um, maybe you're, you're used enough now to type theory to see immediately that that means um, in some sense that there is a unique H which we can regard as the composite of F and G. Okay, so that's what we want to call H in this, this context. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have one. Uh, I think that or at least I'm used to seeing uh, Seagal to describe these kinds of um, properties, but over like um, length n chains of composable uh, morphism. So like does this guarantee, for example, um, a subjectivity of composition or do we further have to impose? Yeah, yeah. So the authors, um, I'm pretty sure I didn't write the paper myself, but I'm uh, quite sure that they have proven that this um, then automatically ensures um, the same thing for uh, lengths of n composable arrows and in particular, everything is automatically associative. Okay. Yeah, so it's actually, cool. yeah, kind of surprisingly, works out surprisingly well, at least compared okay. to the, the classical theory. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And then um, to kind of plug in to a little bit of what Christian was saying on Wednesday, we can um, maybe think about uh, the statement that this guy is contractible and the following um, way if we're maybe kind of thinking um, about simplicial sets. So um, we have here the uh, standard two simplex, again, the solid triangle. And this guy um, I haven't talked about yet, but I'm pretty sure Christian did. And we could easily define it also um, in this theory in the, the way that we define the boundaries. So this guy is just, we could just draw it. It's just the, um, the boundary, part of the boundary of the standard two simplex that just has um, this guy and this guy, and we're including it here into the, the standard two simplex. Okay, so to ask that a type is Siegel, uh, at least according to this definition, is to say that the um, space of, that we, if we look at the, the lifting problems of this map here, 
against A, um, we certainly have a lift and it's uh, unique. The space of lifts is unique or is contractible, I mean. Okay, so we get now um, in our theory, we have a notion of equivalences, but I didn't talk too much about, but as I mentioned very briefly, they just import the normal identity types on top of the um, shape uh, cubes and toe layers of Martin lift type theory. And then they emulate uh, very closely the um, work done by the cubicle type theorists to define um, this notion, this extra notion of irreversible uh, paths within each type. And so these of course are supposed to model or supposed to represent um, the equivalences in any infinity one category. And these of course, the cells, the zero cells, the one cells, the two cells, all the morphisms in a infinity one category. Okay, and uh, yes, so I also wanted to say um, that there is um, in this, this work, um, a lot of impressive higher category theory that um, they and others have managed to do, but I, I won't talk about that. Um, okay, so um, I also want to point out, um, not necessarily a deficiency because this, this theory is very robust, but something um, that you might hope for in a dependent type theory. So uh, not all dependent types in this type theory are functorial in, and not all dependent types of this form are functorial in A. And what I mean by that is that we don't have a kind of directed transport. So um, we always have in normal Martin Left type theory, of course, uh, this thing transport. So we have two points in A um, and dependent type like this and a path from uh, X to Y in the normal Martin Luff um, identity type, then we of course get this transport function from D of X to D of Y. But in this uh, theory, we don't always have the following. So I've now left out the uh, cubes and top layer, but um, if we just consider two points in A, a homomorphism between them, we don't always have um, a function between D of X and D of Y. Um, so I want to also um, just remark that uh, the authors, Brill and Schulman, they introduce uh, covariant dependent types where this is true. So they cut down on the, the number of uh, dependent types that they consider, and they show um, that this is true for those guys. It's even true for more guys, but certainly not for all guys. And um, should also mention something very interesting, which I don't have time to get into that um, Cavallo, Real, and Sattler have proved directed univalence um, for these covariant dependent types. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, no, I have a little bit more to say about this. So um, they also uh, show that there are many models in what people who are familiar with these uh, probably already expect based on the names. So um, the models are in Siegel spaces. Um, which I won't get into, but they are uh, one way to um, define infinity one categories in terms of by simplicial sets. Um, and that's not all the models they give, but all the models have this, this kind of flavor. Okay, so that's all I have to say about the real um, Shulman directed type theory. Does anybody have any questions? I'm not following the chat because it's moving a bit fast for me. Um, so if anyone wants to ask any of those questions out loud, please do. Um, would you be able, or do they talk about that, um, to model like higher Siegel spaces, like Siegel two spaces? Um, no, yeah, so they, I don't think they have okay. attempted to do this or, and I don't think I have heard of anyone who has attempted to do this, but <laughs> that might be very interesting to do. Thanks. Okay, so this is one approach to, um, to defining uh, a directed type theory. Now I'm gonna talk about like almost an opposite approach, at least um, that's how it feels to me. Um, and so this is um, largely my work with a few co-authors. Um, okay, so what's different about this 
So this is meant to um, be more applicable to directed spaces. So in the beginning, I talked about um, higher categories and directed spaces, which are very similar, but not exactly the same thing. So this is more intended to plug into the theory of um, directed topological spaces. Um, and in these two, or in this um, field, we have directed irreversible paths um, and undirected slash reversible paths where the, the directed ones are the um, chosen flow in the space that we found using the intuition from dynamical systems. And the undirected ones are the ambient paths in, in the ambient space. So we're always um, choosing a subset of, of paths. So that's why the directed ones are, um, should write, included. Um, in the undirected reversible paths. But actually in this theory, I want to um, be a bit more general and at least just based on the um, ground rules, not force any um, relationship between these two things and um, then, then add in axioms um, describing how they're related. Okay, so in this theory, um, we use uh, for the undirected, Reversible paths, again, we just leave the identity type alone because that does the job pretty well. And, but for the directed paths, instead of using an analog of um, the interval in cubicle type theory, what they do in cubicle type theory, I'm now trying to use an analog of the original Martin Luff identity type. Okay, so the goal um, is to reproduce the original Martin Luff identity type with everything we can get except for reversibility. Um, and in particular, any dependent type um, now will automatically be functorial um, in this argument X, meaning that we have this kind of transport. But I should be clear that um, there are some, there are some restrictions now, not on the dependent types for which this is true, but on the, the morphisms along which we're maybe trying to transport things. So um, the last theory had its models in um, models of infinity one categories as intended. And this, um, this work is more uh, intended to uh, have a model in anything that has some, in any category that has some notion of direction. Um, and so technically I am working on um, this kind of stuff with some co-authors, uh, Ben and Vandenberg and Aaron McCloskey to um, define technically a directed version of a weak factorization system. So I think you saw um, in Christian's talk that um, weak factorization systems, uh, you might say are always uh, implicated in a model of homotopy type theory. So we want now to, well, I should say maybe the weak factorization systems are implicated in any model of type theory because they kind of um, describe the homotopical um, content of the category. So in particular, the, the paths and stuff like that. Um, and now we want a directed version of that in any category. Um, so examples of these kind of things are category of categories, simplicial sets, directed spaces, um, most things which have, um, which, whose objects have some notion of directed paths um, within them. Okay, so I'll just stick mainly to the type theory, not so much the semantics. And first talk about um, the foundation. Maybe I can zoom in here because it looks a little bit small. Um, so here are some rules. Here's the first bunch of rules. So we want to um, talk about types now, um, very similarly to how we might talk about categories. So uh, for every category, we have um, a subcategory, which is the largest groupoid. So we just like remove all the arrows that are invertible and we call that the core of a category. So now we're assuming that we have um, something similar for every type, we have a core. Um, and also for every type, we have another type, uh, T-op, where uh, T-op we should at least intuitively imagine is T with all of the arrows or all of the, the paths reversed. And then um, we want inclusions from T-core um, into T. So here we have, um, you could say a morphism I from T core into T, and here we have a morphism I op that's including T core also into T op. So if you have, for example, a category, you take, you throw away all of the um, 
non-reversible morphisms to get the core that includes into the category and also into the opposite category. Okay, um, let me zoom out a little bit now. So we can think of um, op and core perhaps as modalities. And I thought about maybe talking about this a lot more in this talk because I think this is, this is very interesting. Um, but I want to say that if you're interested in like what's uh, cool right now in homotopy type three, what are people, uh, what's kind of on the edges of the research, what are people trying to push into, um, I would say that modal type theory is um, one very cool thing. Uh, so I just want to point out that these are some kind of modalities, but I'm not going to get into what modal type theory is. Um, just a little pointer. Okay, now um, on top of these foundational rules, we can define um, rules for HOM, um, which is uh, the directed version of id, let's say. So I've written the rules here. Um, and in this for first column, I have the normal rules for the identity type so that we can compare because they're very similar. And then in this column, um, we have the rules for the HOM type um, and I have highlighted everywhere um, the, the differences. So um, I might start to go quickly now because I'm coming to the end of my time and I, this is the last lecture so I don't want to tire everyone out too much. Um, but anyway, so we have um, normally for any two points uh, or any two terms in a type, an identity type. Now here, um, emulating maybe um, the um, HOM functor from uh, a category into set, we want to take this um, first argument to be in a op. And now the introduction rule for id starts with um, a reflexivity, or we, we start with a term in A and we get a reflexivity map between A and A. And now we want the same thing. We certainly want an identity morphism between any A and A. But this guy has to be in um, A op, and this guy has to be in A. So the only things that we can really identify that are in both A op and A um, come from the core. So we only have this um, kind of reflexivity guy for objects in the core. Okay, now um, maybe I will skip going through the elimination rules very in very much detail. Um, but here we have the elimination rule for the identity type. And now in this, um, theory, maybe not surprisingly, because we're directed, we have both left and right um, elimination rules. And roughly what these are saying is that um, we can only kind of uh, extend or uh, do transport um, given a dependent type um, either forward given, um, well, either forward along the, the second argument or backwards along the first argument. So this right rule is um, doing transport forwards along the second ele element and the left rule is doing transport backwards along the first element. And similarly, we have um, computation rules that are obvious, just the, the new things that we get from these elimination rules if we're with the old things. Okay, so we can certainly prove um, functoriality um, or you might call it transport, um, which is, I guess, basically how I just described the elimination rule. So if we have any um, morphism like this in any element, ah, is there something missing here? Any element um, of our dependent type, then we can um, extend it in a, a way analogous to transport. And um, you might be a little bit surprised that F has to start um, with something in the core but it makes sense given um, maybe the, the nicest application of functoriality, which is composition. So composition is an instance of functoriality and um, exactly for the reason that this guy has to come from the core, um, both of these guys have to come from the core, but that makes sense, right? Because if we want to um, compose an arrow from F to something and an arrow from something, or sorry, an arrow from A to something and an arrow from something to C, and there's something in the middle should both be able to be put into this place, which needs something just from A and into this spot, which needs something from A up. So it has to be something from the core. And um, so this, this restriction is, is not at all surprising. Okay, so thankfully I'm coming to the end now, um, right on time. So uh, there are many questions in this theory. Um, it's not as well developed as the real Shulman theory. So for example, um, 
we might want to understand how to um, define sigma. Sigma is maybe very straightforward, uh, but pi is a little bit difficult because of the, the variance in the arrows and other um, type formers, and also um, formulate some version of benevolence. Okay, um, so that's it basically for my talk. Um, before I end, I just want to um, uh, list some citations because I, I view this talk as a kind of um, doorway into a lot of uh, interesting ideas um, being developed right now in, in the world of homotopy type theory. Um, so there are certainly the, beyond these two um, stories about directed type theory, there are certainly many more. Um, in particular, there are these, these four um, very different uh, other approaches to, to directed type theory. Um, we also, I also uh, mentioned very briefly modal type theory as being a cool thing that I don't think was talked about very much in this, this week. Um, and I uh, think of these two papers as being the most um, general uh, best introductions to the, to the topic. So I'd recommend them. Um, and then I also have listed some references um, about interesting ideas in directed topology. So here's the reference about concurrency. Here's the one about um, combinatorial representations of directed spaces. And here's one um, about that uh, approach or that application to um, neural networks. Okay, so that's it. Um,